Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name's Daniel Yang, the director of the Sen Institute, and our guest today is Steve Carter. Steve is a pastor, speaker, podcaster, and the former lead teaching pastor of Willow Creek Community Church. He's an itinerant preacher and teacher for churches, conferences, and events, and he's also the author of his latest book, The Thing Beneath the Thing, What's Hidden Inside and What God Helps Us Do About It. You say it like five times, The Thing, the thing, the thing Beneath, beneath the Thing. Thing. Okay, I like it. We're excited to talk more with Steve about it, but before we do that, let's hear from our host, editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and the executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center, Ed Stetzer. Well, it is good to have Steve on, and Steve and I go back, and we'll talk some about that in just a bit, but we're particularly ha- excited to talk about a very timely book. Um, we have seen um, Christian leaders where the thing beneath the thing has actually overcome the thing and more. And so I'm super excited that you wrote this book, found it helpful, challenging, uh, and more, Steve. So thanks for, thanks for joining us in this conversation. And let's just start with this. Uh, what did you mean by the phrase, the thing beneath the thing and what made you want to write a book on the topic? Yeah. Well, first off, it's great to see you guys. I, I just think the world of you two and love, love, love the chance to, to anytime I get to chop it up with you both. And, the thing beneath the thing actually um, was a phrase that a mentor had said to me um, one day. I had um, we were on the verge of moving from Grand Rapids, Michigan, to a new kingdom assignment in Southern California at Rock Harbor, and I was stressed. It was about 2008. You know, it was hard to sell a home in Michigan, and I was completely unaware of what was going on within me. Uh, the people who had decided to back out of our house or who buy our house decided to back out of our house. My um, father had leukemia. I was leaving uh, my grandparents home one day and just had all this stuff inside me when um, all of a sudden in a snowstorm, a huge chunk of ice hit our windshield. And I realized somebody threw that at us. And I flipped a U-turn, pulled the car over left my wife and nine month old in the back of the car. And I went chasing after these kids who threw a chunk of ice at our car. And it, as I started to realize why I was doing what I was doing, it was because I was afraid. Uh, People had backed out of buying our house. I was stressed. I was sad to leave my dad who was sick. I, I knew God was inviting us into this new assignment, but I, I didn't want to leave a community that I loved. And so I did not know how to access my heart. Um, And all of a sudden, this chunk of ice gave me permission. So when I called a a mentor of mine the next day, he laughed and he just said, welcome to the thing beneath the thing, the endless discovery of what's really going on. And that phrase just stuck. I, I, I realized, man, we are people who live above the surface and we never spend enough time mining what's really going on underneath. And last thing I'd say about it is, is Paul says in Romans, uh, I do not understand what I do. Um, And I like to quote the scriptures, but when I don't follow through on something or I I do something that's pretty bonehead or dumb, I can't tell my wife, hey, babe, just like Paul says, I do not understand what I do. (laughs) She's going to say, start understanding, Steve. Right. That's all. (laughs) And so this has been my attempt to try to help people understand a little bit more why they do what they do by accessing the thing beneath the thing. You, Steve, I appreciate a couple of things about you. Number one, uh, your passion for Wolverine basketball. Like I just, uh, you're, oh. you're on your. Uh, he like had a sports <laughs> podcast. So, That's right. Like it's, do you still do the sports podcast? Yeah, we we just took a little uh, season break okay. because a uh, season break because it's yeah. a season because it's That's right. a yeah, yeah, sports yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but also, I mean, you're a great communicator. So, uh, and one of the things that you talk about is insecurity, which you know people can understand that in different ways, but. You phrase it as this idea of false narratives, the stories that we tell ourselves, um, and how that contributes to to the worst of us, especially in in stressful situations. Like, unpack that a little bit. Like, tell us about like insecurities, false narratives, and how really stress can actually bring those things out of us. Yeah, you know, whenever we get triggered, you know, it's the setup that sets us off. 
So some, something happens, you know, you're, you're going through your day, somebody cuts you off, someone doesn't follow through, someone minimizes you on Twitter, someone tries to manage you. All of a sudden, that's connected to old pain points in your story. And somebody's gotten close to that old pain point that we've not actually dealt with. But we all tend to go to different places. Um, for some of us, we go into hiding. Um, but for a lot of us, we go into insecurity. And that's where we just create false stories about ourselves um, or narratives where we create false stories about other people. And what's amazing is, you know, I, I would say this as a student pastor all the time to parents, kids are very, very perceptive. They're just not always the best interpreters of reality. So kids can perceive that mom and dad are fighting, but it's the stories that they tell where they get themselves in trouble. Mom and dad are fighting because of me. Mom and dad are getting divorced because of me. And, and we do this on the regular, right? We, we get triggered and all of a sudden, oh, I'm not enough. Oh man, I'll never be as good as this person. Oh man. And all of a sudden the enemy comes in and insecurity, we forget that we're creating God's image. We're for, we forget the spiritual gifts that God's given to us. And all of a sudden, the lies of the enemy just take over. Or we look for villains and we get triggered. And it's easy for us to create actual stories that are false about another person, another race, another church, another person that we feel competitive towards, than actually deal with the thing beneath the thing. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's been... Um, realizing, and it all kind of came out of a story um, because someone had minimized an idea of mine in a meeting and it frustrated me. And I came home and told my wife and my wife looks at me and goes, isn't God so kind? And I'm like, what do you mean? God's so kind. This guy was a jerk in the meeting, have my back. And she says, <laughs> she's like, I'm like, why is God so kind? She goes, God's so kind that he keeps bringing people into your life who remind you of someone who deeply wounded you. And until you have the courageous curiosity to deal with that, you're going to continue to look for villains and your life's going to be held in check. And so for me, I realized that God's kindness is to actually fill in those pain points, those potholes, those, those parts in our story that we've been wounded. So we don't have to live in insecurity or creating false narratives, but we can live in the trust and the security of who he created us and made us to be. Yeah, the and I, I really found the book helpful. And again, I want to remind people again, it's called The Thing Beneath the Thing, What's Hidden Inside and What God Helps Us to Do About It. The, the title is impossibly too long, but you can talk to your <laughs> publisher about that. Um, but um, even in this conversation, you know, people are listening and saying, Steve Carter, Willow Creek. Um, and what is this coming from? Is this related to the Willow Creek, um, you know, problems, disaster, I mean, a hundred different things. And we were, just before we came on, you and I were both scrolling back through our texts. And uh, May 27th, 2018, uh, we were texting back and forth as the Chicago Tribune story came out, as Willow Creek seeks reconciliation, pastors, accusers seek independent inqu inquiry. And we talked several times and, and kind of went through some of these conversations. And then that, that morning on uh, August 5th, 2018, I texted you the New York Times story. I'm sure others did, but uh, and that's the day you left. You uh, you did the Saturday night service at Willow Creek. Uh, I remember when you called me um, and asked me what I knew. And this was before. This was way before the the this the August year when you walked out that morning. Um, but this was new information that was coming to you. Um, and boy, I mean, just some of these revelations became. Uh, heartbreaking, you know, ab abusers, um, abuse, and and, uh, and and survivors, and and no nowhere would all of this unfold. Five months before, would you know all of this would unfold? So I, I sort of wonder how much of this story, your concern for this story, is based on part of the journey that you walked through. When the, some of these things underneath the things came over and took over everything, and and so many lives were were impacted, so many people were hurt, uh, and 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 more. So, to the degree you're comfortable, reflect a little bit on that journey, and and maybe how that might be a lesson related to the the thing beneath the thing. Yeah. Well, first off, man, again, you were really really kind with your time. You know, and I'll, I'll just never forget a few times you picking up the phone or just returning texts and, and just I needed I needed friends. I needed help. Um, and this was a huge story. And 
Um, I wanted to pastor people well. And, you know, there's, there's a handful of people that I thank God for on a regular, and you're one of them for the ways that just you, you gave wisdom and, and helpful guidance in times that I didn't know what to believe, to be honest. Um, it was just really, really, it was really hard. And I think for me, the, you know, we're, we love like Christian TMZ. You know and I mean, so I think there's a lot of people who would love to know what happened in the boardroom, what happened here, what happened here. And I, um, I mean, I, I've got thoughts and I've got stories and, but that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, I really wanted to, the question that kept, um, kept like, I just felt like wrestling within was why do we do what we do? Like, you know, Paul writes, I don't understand what I do. The good I want to do, I just don't do. But the thing I hate, I do. And this wasn't, this wasn't just Bill. This was happening all around us in different pastors, um, different, you know, media moguls, different athletes, different business leaders. Um, you know, and, and as a pastor for 20 years, nobody came into my office and was like, you know what? Today's the day, Steve. Today's the day I'm going to train wreck my life. Today's the day I'm going to sabotage all the good. Today's the day that I'm going to decimate my character, but it happens. And, you know, I don't think I've ever told you this, Ed, but like, I, I'll never forget being on the stage the day Bill resigned, retired early, whatever people want to call it, whatever happened. And I'm standing on the stage and I'm going to give the closing prayer and right. he walks down and I thought he was just going to go to the bullpen you know, where the pastor sits and the family sits like, and he literally up and left the building. Yeah. And I remember standing there on that stage and I felt two primary emotions. One, like I could have just started weeping. Yeah. Cause I, in one sense, I'm like, you, you know, I remembered my youth pastor, Hal, just saying, um, you, you'll, you'll spend seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, seasons, years, decades to build one thing that can be lost that can be lost in seconds yeah and that's your integrity yeah and to sit in, and stand in one of the biggest auditoriums the best sound one of the largest budgets who've done some of the most amazing good and all of a sudden overnight the decisions that had been made in secret had come to the surface yeah and i realized in that moment he'll probably never step foot back in that building again yeah. And I just, I, I felt it. The second thing I felt was the mantle. Who's going to pastor these people now? Right, right. Who's going to shepherd people towards the truth? So you just, you had this sense like, oh my goodness. And I, I felt like for the people, like I stayed in that room. I was one of like the last people to leave that auditorium and the amount of people who were wrestling with, I, I got saved here. Right. Like I, I, my life was transformed here. There was so much good that, what do I do with this? And there was this cognitive dissonance of, I don't know what to believe. Yeah. And, and you come back to the real question is why would he do this? Right. Why did this happen? And it, and, and it's easier as a, as a human to go, why did they do it? Right. The harder question to ask, why do I do it? And why, why, why do I say things I wish I didn't say? Why do I right. feel the temptation to tweet things I wish I didn't tweet? Right. Why, and, and I just wanted to try and wrestle um, through conversations around formation, around therapy, and around the biblical text to kind of go, why do we do what we do? And what does the yeah. scriptures have to say about it? So it was well, informed yeah. by, by what happened, for sure. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I do appreciate the fact that you keep coming back to and it's not like an author coming back to the book because we, we, you know, Steve and I know each other. We talk uh, offline, um, but you have not, um, you have not made the failures at Willow Creek, uh, Bill's failures and failures of governance and the failures to listen to, you know, survivors and more. You have not. Uh, that's not been the focus of your ministry, though. Again, you've been very vocal in support of survivors, and I'm thankful for that and more. Um, but at the same time. Um, you have wanted to look in, inside yourself and ourselves. I think with the caution I would say with that is we need to be very careful because what, um, you know, when we say there but the grace of God go I, 
but we've got situations that are abuse and others. That's not the same thing. So we want to say, totally. right. And that's, and I'm just clarifying that in case anyone's listening. I know we, we've talked about this. I want to make sure that we're not saying there, but the grace of God go I on situations like, like, like you walk through and others. Um, but I do think, I mean, you have a fascinating journey that's very painful. Um, we joked, um, at a very appropriate time, but that you and your bio at when you're at Willow Creek, your bio at Willow Creek said, you know, I, I, I went to Michigan because a guy named Rob called me and, and so creative. And it was just so amazing. And, um, and that was Rob Bell, you know, and, but you don't, you didn't say that on your Willow Creek bio. And then now in a sense, you know, you go, you become teaching pastor at, uh, you know, what Forbes magazine called the most influential church in the world outside of the Vatican. Uh, and because Bill recruited you, and now that has, um, and again, just so we're very clear, it's very different situations between Rob and Bill, and you know, with all the caveats that are that are there. I, I just I appreciate that from your pain of seeing and struggling through some of these things, the thing beneath the thing is something that you would write and administer to me, and I think it's going to minister to other people. So I want to encourage people to get that. So. In the midst of all that, you know, because I, I want to, you know, I, I, and you've told these stories different places. You know, I want to talk about, you know, what happened that morning after that New York Times, or I want to talk about those things, and we could talk about things, but you talk about those things other places. So, what more about your own journey would you want to share here that then impacted the book you wrote, either Willow or elsewhere? And then let's get back and continue our conversation a little bit more around the book. But what more from your own life shapes this, even from the Willow Creek or other situations as well? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is I had a really great experience at Mars Hill. Yeah. Um, I was there from the jump and, you know, we, we left Southern California to move to Grand Rapids because my parents had come to faith and hmm. we got connected to Mars Hill. And I showed up, I think, week seven and we're at Leviticus seven. And huh. Wow. Um, and so I went, I, I was a film major and it was through what I saw happening at Mars Hill that God used to say, I want you to go do this. I went back to California. Um, and then Rob invited me, uh, because someone had pulled him aside and said, Jesus didn't change the world by speaking to the masses. He changed the world by having disciples. So who are you pouring your life into? And I moved into his basement and he's been really good you know, to me. We've listened to the rise and fall of Mars Hill Hill, and you shouldn't live in the pastor's basement. That's been yes. a recurring theme <laughs> in the rise and fall of Mars Hill, but keep going, keep going. <laughs> but I, but I would say, uh, my, my experience with, with him has always been really, really good. Even yeah. on August 5th, when I left, he was in Brazil and heard about it and he called yeah. me. And yeah. so, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a different thing where I feel like, you know, for him, he's either a one or a five on Amazon. <laughs> People either hate him or love him. <laughs> yeah. And, and he's I, theologically, he's taken a different trajectory, trajectory theologically again, for sure. in no way no connecting way. Yep. to the same thing with but Bill. Yeah. Um, so, but I learned, I learned parts uh, from him and then to go to be with Bill and Bill was like, I mean, it was consistent. I mean, it was 40 some years building something, the, the origin story. I mean, it, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And so I think like for me, the, the, the piece and, and even listening to the rise and fall of Mars Hill, I mean, it's been just a, a bit of an eye opening experience. Episode two, I'm at the Raleigh airport and I'm, I'm listening with my eyes closed just as I'm waiting to board a plane and I hear Bill's voice. That's the first time I heard his voice in oh, wow. three years. And I, I, I totally jumped, you know, and, wow. and there's this part of like just profound sadness. It's just sadness. And so I think, I just think in all of this is realizing the truth of for all of us, including myself, we all have to do work. And if there's anything that's redemptive about Twitter, it's the truth will come out. <laughs> it just, it just yeah. will come out. True. And so, True. so let's get ahead of it and let's, let's, find the practices, the spiritual exercises and discovery of sanctifying grace that Wesley talks about that can really make us whole, holy, oh, and spiritually healthy. Hello. The Westerns will like that. I, I often tweet, character catches up, people figure out, and mm. they, 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 they do. Preach. It's Steve, for church leaders right now, that they, they sense that I might be going through the thing. Like, they don't know yet, you know, but they don't want it to become the thing that becomes, uh, you know, beneath the thing. How help them walk through that? Like if they you know, there's a situation and they know that there could be a buildup and and they know that it, it could affect them long term and, and cause trauma and 
and, be, and you know, you have to be careful for triggers. Like if you're going through a situation, what are some things that you can give to them to navigate the situation? That's good. That's, good. That's great, Daniel. I, you know, first thing is Jim Cress, he's a counselor. Uh, he told me, Steve, whenever you get hysterical, it's most likely historical. And so if you, if you think about this, just from a pastoral side, if there's a moment you're in a meeting and you're like, you feel like vamped, like you are angry, you are defensive, you are just scared, like it's most likely historical. And I, I, I just would say, if you're, if you're finding yourself having those level of feelings, you probably need some help to get you there. It might be a therapist, might be a spiritual director, might be another pastor who can just, who's maybe a, you know, a decade down the road who can just walk with you. But I think just starting to listen to your body, if you find yourself like with rabid, insecure thoughts that are happening, man, that's, that's most likely historical. So where's that coming from? And that's going to prevent the power uh, of, of your words from the pulpit. And so I, I think, you know, for me, I'm a sports guy. It's, you know, Daniel, you and I connect over this, but you know, when, when Tiger Woods, he wins the masters and what does he do? He recognizes there's something in his swing that's off and he breaks his entire swing down and people like couldn't believe it, but that's how committed he was to his craft. Um, I think for, for the church and for the pastor, we have to be committed to our craft and our character. And if we don't go back and get curious about those issues, that trauma, that pain, that people pleasing tendency, it will be found out Um, Mm -hmm. because it, it just, it just, it just will. And so for me, I, I mean, every Monday I'm in a counselor's office. Yeah. I, I, you can't hold the stories that we hold on the regular um, and it not do something to your soul. You can't be in, on, in social media with 51% of the people loving you and 49% of the people hating you or the other side around with, without like it doing something to your mind and your heart. And we need guides. We need to actually um, finish the race. And every time I get in my car, I drive home from preaching in the weekend. I just kind of pray these little words, thanks be to God, I'm one weekend closer to finishing well. Wow. And that's what I want to do, is I want to finish this race well. Yeah, it was. we were actually recording uh, from our side at Billy Graham Hall. And just on the other side of this wall over here, we had Ray Ortland was in here recently teaching a class, the uh, cohort of pastors that I brought in. He just left, Emmanuel. Um, I think he's an Anglican now. Did I tell you he was an mm-hmm. Anglican now? Yeah. Everyone becomes yeah. an Anglican. It's a Wheaton College <laughs> it's thing. It's a trend. Um, and all the cool kids, but, um, but he, he said, this is right after Rabbi Zacharias. And he says, if there's one thing I owe you, he's talking to the students, he says, it's to finish well. And I think that this has just been a pretty shattering few years about people not finishing well. And what I love about, again, the book's the thing beneath the thing. What I love about the, your book is it's not just some like idea. I got to finish well. You mentioned you're driving up for church. Say, I got it one week closer to finishing well. But there's stuff you got, there's work you got to do. And I love the fact that you just casually mentioned you see a counselor. I think that's good. I think pastors should mention that, right? But there's work you got to do. So what are the, some, why are we sometimes oblivious to the fact that our past experiences are driving our present behavior? How do, how do we become more aware? Big theme of the book. How do we become aware and why are we so oblivious to the replay in the tapes that kind of come out and cause some of the challenges we have today? I just think we're, we're so busy. I, and then when you also feel the pressure of, I got to be in front of 150, 3,000 people to 5,000 people on Sunday, you, you just feel like, I don't know if I can open up this box. And I think part of it is a logistical calendaring issue. I think two is, I, I've known how to manage all of this stuff in the past. I can manage my stuff. And truth is, um, you can't. And so, uh, you know, and, and any time as, you know, a counselor will tell me, whenever you react, you're just reenacting the past. And I, I want to be someone who responds differently. And Dallas Willard had a great line. He says, grace is opposed to earning, but grace is never opposed to effort. And it takes the effort to get that sanctifying grace into every past trauma, abuse, every choice that we've made, every broken pattern and sin. And I think for, for us, as leaders and as pastors, we have to go first. We have to model 
what we are saying and preaching and proclaiming that grace is the best thing, that we can be honest, that repentance is beautiful, that we can acknowledge truth about ourselves and go first. And, and if we can't do it, our congregation's not going to be able to do it. And so for me, I just feel like um, this is the work of surrender. This is the, the, the beauty of walking in the steps of Christ. Um, and unfortunately, I think for many of us, we probably have more of a Constantinian kind of view. It's more conquering. Um, and it feels soft to actually look at what's really going on. But unfortunately, what's, 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 what are people talking about? I'm not talking about the, all of the great ministry that, that Ravi did. They're talking about those, what was on that phone, right? And so, so you think that's the lasting memory. That's the lasting storyline. And now every time his name is mentioned, it's all the other people that are attached to it and what they're now doing with their life. And so it's just the collateral damage of it. And, and the truth is like when we're sinning or whenever we're doing our thing, we don't think about what our kids are going to have to carry, what our congregation is going to have to carry, what our staff's going to have to carry, what our staff's kids are going to have to carry. We don't think about that. And until we can actually begin to recognize, oh my goodness, the collateral damage is deep. And the healthiest gift that I can give to my family, to my congregation, to the kingdom is a life that's fully surrendered to God, the beauty and the brokenness. And to be honest and human about that and do your work. So let me take Ed's question like another level. Uh, what if you're someone subordinate and, or you're working with somebody and you, you see them struggling with the thing, but they, they, can't, they can't name it for themselves, um, but it's, it's now impacting everyone. It's impacting the team. It's impacting their family even. And as somebody who's maybe working alongside of them or... Um, uh, you know, uh, one of their subordinates, how, how do you help them become aware without, um, and maybe it, it takes confrontation, I don't know, but help somebody who might be in that situation think through how they might help somebody become more self-aware? It's a great question. So two thoughts come to mind. First one is something my dad said. I brought a girl home from college once. And I was really curious of what he thought. And and he just said to me <clears throat> the next morning after you know, she had left the night before and I just said, hey, what do you think, dad? He goes, hey, it doesn't matter what I think. Like, you know what really you got to understand is that every person has crazy in their closet. You just have to realize which crazy you can live with and not spend your entire life trying to fix or change, but that you can pray for. And I, I remember going, that's genius. And then I'm I got actually going to call my wife right after this podcast and say, honey, <laughs> yeah. crazy. I got like, crazy. She's, she'll be saying, I know. <laughs> I know. But, I, but then I got into the, the bride of Christ in the church and I realized every church culture has crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think sometimes young, younger leaders, they step into a church staff and they don't know what questions to ask. They're just excited about the opportunity. I want to know what the crazy is. I want to know what the culture's like. I want to know, like, will I wake up every day trying to fix something that that culture doesn't want to be fixed. So you yeah. just got to know, like, well, can I love this culture and pray and do what I need to do to help it become everything Christ wants it to be? Or am I going to be beating my head up against a wall, just going, it's got to change. This has got to change. This has got to change. Second thing I'd say this is, and this will be a poker analogy. I don't really play poker, but I was fascinated with why is it on ESPN? I'm far more aware of poker than sports. So this is going to be a plus. Okay. So, all right, yeah. I'm well, ready for this. It, but like, the, I, don't, I don't, I didn't understand why it was on ESPN. And so I just started researching it. And most people play the cards in their hands when they're playing Texas Hold'em. They're dealt like pocket Kings. And they're like, dude, I'm going to, I'm going to win. But it really doesn't matter. Really? Because what matters is your position at the table. What matters is um, kind of like the people that are still in the hand. And what matters is how many chips you have in your, in, in your, your pot. And so like, for me, I started to realize like, man, you might actually have the truth, like pocket aces. Um, this works with evangelism or it also works with like conflict, like you're talking about, but you might not have the position at the table. They might not see you. They might see you as less than they might not, they might not have given you permission because, and you might not have chips of influence to actually go. So there's a bit of like emotional intelligence and, and cultural awareness that you have to be able to go, do I have 
the permission, the position, the cards, and the influence at Mm. the table to be able to bring that up and say, hey, you know I love you, Daniel. You know I'm so for you. But I saw this in you in this meeting that I saw you react. And can you just help me understand? But if if you see me in a different way, you're not going to hear it from me. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to put myself in harm's way. So um, now there are there are sins of like where you're like, man, you were a little defensive. You lost like I felt like you were a little prideful. That's one thing. There's obviously egregious sins that we're talking about of abuse of power and literally like sexual sin or financial issues or time. At, like we've got to actually deal with. And there's probably HR policies, but like places that you have to be able to go to. But for me, I'm just trying to, if I have the permission, I have the position, go as a loving brother and just say, I love you. I'm for you. I saw this. And I'd hope you'd say this to me if you saw this in me. Um, But can you help me understand? And then begin to walk with them through that. And of course, that's, I mean, gosh, I, I, you know, you were here in Chicagoland. I'm in Chicagoland. I mean, Chicagoland has been uniquely impacted by pastoral failures in a way that's, uh, I don't know if there's anything like it right now in the last decade or so in the U.S. And it seems that the God is doing some cleansing, uh, addressing some issues among his people. And I want to be among those who deal with what's in me, because there's stuff in me. There's the thing beneath the thing in me. You know, I grew up in a broken home and a whole nine yards, and I, I recognize my dad and I are very close now. And I, someone asked me one time, said, why do you have two masters and two doctorates? I, so I was trying to prove my, to my father, to something to my father. And he says, well, do your father think that way? No, my father hadn't thought that way for like 50 years, yeah. but I'm still trying to prove something to my father when I was seven. And so one of the things growing in awareness has been a, a good thing, but it's, it's almost... It's almost people think that it's going to be okay if I just keep my head down, keep doing the work, keep following Jesus, keep serving Jesus, and don't let Jesus do the work in their heart. So how do we actually say, how do I say to a pastor and church leader, our audience, right? This is the church leader's pocket. How do I say to a pastor and church leader, it's not going to be all right if you don't address it? You might not be on the front page of the New York Times, but it's not going to be all right. It catches up. You know, it's, it's amazing, Ed, I, and you, you know, you, you helped plant so many churches and sometimes I'd sit with pastors and I'm like, I, I remember being at Willow and I would ask some pastors from different cities, like, Hey, tell me, tell me about your vision. 99.9% of the time, it was the vision of their church. Hmm. There's no vision that they had for their life. You know, and if you think about Dallas Willard, Willard would talk about in the renovation of the heart, vim, vision, intention, and means. And I think everyone has to have a, a vision for themselves. It's just something that they're literally like waking them up, trying to um, trying to almost be shaped and formed in the image of Christ. So for me, my vision right now is a life anchored in Jesus is one that has nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and now Dallas would say, you have intention. Every choice that you make is helping you live into that. Will this help me live out my vision or not? And then the, the M, the means or the methods are the practices that will help you embody that vision. And I, I just think for, for some of us, we, we might do the practice of Sabbath um, or might do the practice of silence or solitude, the practice of prayer. But I often wonder, is that actually connected to a trauma or a pain point or a pothole in our story? Or are we just doing it because we think we should do it? And so for me, what I'm realizing is that sanctifying grace has to go after those pain points, nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to hide. I'm the most competitive achievement driven person on the planet. And it's good for me to be reminded a life anchored in Christ has nothing to prove, nothing to lose and nothing to hide. And now how do I create practices that begin to shape that inside me so that I can be more like Christ and not like an achievement workaholic? Yeah, I love that you mentioned uh, grace, and uh, you're, you're getting at uh, my next question that I wanted to ask you. As somebody who is working through the process and they're trying to deal with the thing, and they just don't know if they're getting there. You know, it, for me, it's a performance mindset. So I'm thinking, I need to get better now. So I'm going to try to fix myself. But you know, so and I, I, you perpetuate the cycle because yep. I think like a performer. 
So what does it feel like to know when you're operating in grace, when you're dealing mm, with the thing in grace? Like, give me an idea of how it might feel like. Yeah, for, for me, it's more just in the sense of the invitation to know Christ, the invitation to trust Christ, mm -hmm. the invitation of like exhale. Um, I know what it's like to, you know, slap the floor dive for every loose ball, hustle to try and like make it on the team just to be good enough. Like the, the drive Ed, as you were talking about with multiple degrees to try and get this person's approval. I know that feeling in my body, like where I'm reaching yeah. instead of I'm allowing the spirit to like reach and heal me. You know, it's just, it's the, it's the moment of like when I'm studying the scriptures and I know what questions to ask of the text. It's the other thing when I, open up the text and allow it to ask questions of me. And it's just that, that opening myself to the spirit to see, God, what is it that you have for me? Um, and it doesn't feel like work. It feels like an invitation into the deeper streams, into just the sense of God being with me in the midst of that, you know, in first Timothy, you know, Paul says, you know, even though I was once a persecutor, a blasphemer, a violent man, but God showed me this immense patience, this mercy. And then he says these words, because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. And I, I, th I think that there's so many times where we as pastors, we just acted as kids or college students or 20 somethings or 30 somethings or 40 somethings in ignorance or unbelief of what Christ could do through that pain or that trauma. And for me, it's just recognizing the immense patience Christ shows me isn't something I'm proving or managing, but I'm allowing to wash over me and help me become who I desire and who I believe God desires me to be. I love it. I love, I want, yeah. I mean, I think we're at a place where pastors are going to have to make some decisions. People listening to this podcast, some of them right now are listening and say, well, I, I should do this. I want to do that. I want to be like this. I want to walk in this truth. But they're struggling. They're unsure. They're like the performative reality of their job is coming right now to mind. Well, but I've got to do this. So I want to encourage people to get the thing beneath the thing, what's it inside and what God helps us to do about it. What other things would you recommend? You mentioned your, your own counseling journey. What other resources and ideas in addition to the thing beneath the thing would you say, pastor, church leader, if this is your area of need right now, here's where I want you to step into. That'll be the last question. Go ahead. Hey, the last thing I would say is just one simple practice that I do typically on Sunday evenings or Monday mornings. It's from Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything flows from it. And so the simple practice is I just look back at the past week and I play it back. And I just think, hey, was there some area where I didn't guard my heart? And I just go, what was happening there? Um, was I tired? Was I stressed? Was I hungry? What, what was going on? And then I spend some time playing it out. I look ahead to the next 168 hours and I go, imagining myself in the same situation, but I imagine not reacting or letting the past dictate, but I go, Christ, how would you want me to respond? I almost like just play it out. And then thirdly, I don't just play it back or play it out. I play it smart because if everything's going to flow from my heart, how am I taking care of my heart this week? What do I need to do? Am I, is it with practices? Is it date night? Is it being in God's word, but what am I doing to play it smart um, and really refuel my heart? Last thing, not just play it back, not just play it out, not just play it smart, but I play it honest. And too many pastors, how are you doing? Good. No, how are you really doing? Like, how, like decide to play it honest. Your feelings have movement. That's why they call it emotion. And until we can acknowledge what we are really going through and deal with that, I promise you, you will connect more with your congregation because this is what they are having to wrestle with. If we don't do this work, we are going to prevent our people from doing that work. So let's go first, play it back, play it out, play it smart, play it honest. And through that, let God use you to do incredible things for his glory and his kingdom. You've been listening to some incredible insight from Steve Carter, the author of his newest book, The Thing Beneath the Thing. You can also learn more about Steve at stevecarter.org. Again, make sure you grab his book, The Thing Beneath the Thing. And hey, thanks again for listening to the Setzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry at churchleaders.com. And if you found our helpful 
uh, conversation helpful with Steve today. We'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review on iTunes. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. You can find this podcast as well as other great Christian podcasts on Faith Play app, available for both Apple and Android. We'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.